Very warm welcome to today's current legal problems lecture. My name is Dr. Mark D'Souza. I am one of the three editors of the current legal problems lecture series and journal. And my role today is going to be extremely limited. It's only going to be to introduce our chair for today's lecture, which chair, the lecture is going to be delivered by Professor Diamond Eshagba on race, legal form, and the labor contract. And our chair for tonight is Professor Nicola Conturis, Professor Conturis, who is Professor of Labor Law and European Law here at UCL Laws, has just returned to us from a three-year stint as Director of Research at the Brussels-based European Trade Union Institute. And he has acted as independent expert for the International Labor Office, the European Trade Union Confederation, and a number of European Commission projects. He's written extensively on labor law and EU law, with an emphasis on comparative and supranational analyses and perspectives. His writing is cited extensively and regularly by both domestic and European courts. So, Nicole, it's an absolute pleasure to have you chairing and moderating today's, uh, Q today's talk, as well as the Q&A session that will follow the lecture. The format for today's event is that Professor Ashagbor will speak for approximately 40 to 45 minutes. That will be followed by about 15, 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A which we realize is very short, and therefore we invite and strongly urge you to join us for a drinks reception immediately after the lecture, which will be just outside here. And at that time, you might be able to catch Professor Shagbar and raise any burning issues that you haven't been able to raise during the Q&A in this room. Um, toilets outside, um, to the left and to the right downstairs. So if you need any help, find one of us around, we'll, we'll direct you. Um, and we don't expect any fire alarms to go off. So if it goes up, it's a real thing. And that's all I'm going to say now. Uh, all I'm going to do now is ask Professor Conturis to introduce our speaker for the, for the evening. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, friends. Uh, it is really my great pleasure to introduce Professor, Professor Diamond Ajakbo tonight. Uh, she will be delivering her second current legal problems lecture. Um, and the title of her lecture tonight is Race, Legal Form and the Labor Contract. Diamond Ajakbo, as many of you will know, is Professor of Law at the University of Kent here in the UK. She has previously been Professor of Law at Source University of London a reader in law at the University, at University College London here in a Faculty of Laws, and has held visiting positions at Colum Columbia Law School, Melbourne Law School, and Osgoode Hall. She's a graduate of the University of Oxford and has a PhD from the European University Institute in Florence. I consider it a particular mark of distinction that prior to embarking in a uniquely distinguished academic career, she qualified as an employment specialist and worked for Thompson Solicitors, the employment law firm servicing the British trade union movement and the TUC. Professor Jacques Bor is an interdisciplinary legal scholar whose research and teaching span labor law, equality law, uh, race and colonialism, regionalism, European Union and the African Union, trade and development and the economic sociology of law. Her more recent edited book was Reimagining Labor Law for Development in Former Work in the Global North and South by Hart Publishing. She has made important contributions in the domain of EU labor law and social policy, and her UP monograph on the European employment strategy, labor market regulation, and new governance remains one of the most significant publications on the subject. I, like many others in this room, have learned a lot from Professor Ajakbo's work. She's a member of the editorial board of European Law Open and a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences and has won her work and herself have won several prizes and awards, including the Peter Burke's SLS Prize for Outstanding Legal Scholarship, a Fenner Broider Senior Fellowship, a Liverhume Trust a Research Fellowship, and a British Academy Senior Research Fellowship. She's a trustee of Black Cultural Archives, the UK's only national heritage center dedicated to collecting, preserving, and celebrating the histories of African Caribbean people in Britain. 
Tonight, Professor Rajagbar is sharing with us her uh, recent research and insights on a topic of great academic but also societal importance, exploring the intersections between race, legal form and the labour contract. Her work adds an important dimension to the received wisdom that labour relations in general and the standard employment relationship in particular ought to be structured and regulated to address and redress the traditional labour versus capital asymmetry. She correctly points out that race and gender also require a particular focus, both in terms of understanding the current largely inadequate institutions regulating labour relations, and in terms of reforming them with a view of reforming the labour contract and labour law at large. In doing so, she reveals the many dimensions of intersectionality between market forces, colonial legacies, and racial and gender prejudice that continue to shape our working lives. At a time in which these very same forces conspire to justify the closure of university courses on race and colonialism and entire black British literature degrees, there could not be a more timely and relevant CLP lecture to listen to and learn from, uh, also with a view to inform our understanding of academic freedom and academic excellence. Professor Rajagbo, dear Diamond, without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'd like to start by thanking Dr. Mark de Souza and uh, Christina Giannacopoulou and the rest of the current legal problems team at uh, UCL and also thank everybody for coming today in person and also those who are listening to the live stream and perhaps or perhaps watching this lecture as a recording. And I particularly want to thank Nicola, Professor Kentouris for such a generous introduction and for being such fantastic colleagues when we were overlapping at UCL. Um, so in recent years, my research has engaged in historicizing labor by exploring the colonial roots of contemporary labor law. Um, sorry. The, the starting point is that um, the starting point is that race and the legacies of colonialism are central to modern economic and working life, but are absent from labor law scholarship. As Nicola has already identified, has pointed out, the contemporary, la contemporary labour law scholarship takes the labour capital relation as its central fault line around which working lives and market regulation are and ought to be organised. My broader research project, which is funded by the British Academy Senior Research Fellowship, offers a corrector to this view by taking race as well as gender and the legacies of colonialism as central elements of labour law and markets. Um, so what I want to do is learn from the colonial past of work to understand the, its present. And so this project radically reconceptualizes labor law, placing race at the center of the labor contract. It identifies ways in which race, racism, and the legacies of colonialism are implicated in the emergence of paid work, in the forms of law regulating transitions from slavery to indenture to free labor, in the construction of the post-war welfare state, and in the law regulating modern labor markets. So what I want to do in this research project is to bring to the surface to develop methods for conceptualizing the role of race and colonialism in the evolution of the legal forms through which contemporary work organization is governed. It's long been recognized that uh, the transition from feudal to modern work relations entailed ongoing obligations of obedience, discipline, and service for workers, albeit in new legal forms. Recent scholarship has made it clear that there was no clean break between unfree and free labour, whether on the plantations after the abolition of slavery, in the introduction of indentured labour, or in the quasi-penal master-servant model of capitalist work relations. This lecture will focus on the second part of that research project, on the forms of law regulating unfree work, such as slavery and indenture, how that was racialized and how these forms prefigure or look ahead to contemporary racialized exclusions from institutions of social citizenship, such as the standard employment relationship. Okay. So the focus, as I said, will be on 
conceptualizing that transition in order to give us the foundations to understand contemporary labor law. Um, but this lecture isn't going to be so much about contemporary work organization. I'm not going to be talking about Deliveroo and Uber. But I'm going to be talking about how we got to where we've got to, and especially that racialized configuration of precarious, modern precarious work. I'm interested in studying the transition from unfree to free labor alongside the growth of wage labor, both being instances, oops, both being instances of what's known as this sort of axiomatic classic movement from status to contract. My hypothesis is that colonial legal forms, new types of labor control developed in the course of colonial administration and innovative methods developed um, in the management of slavery, in particular what's what's being referred to as slavery scientific management, use forms and technologies which continue to provide the legal infrastructure of work relations today. My focus is on legal forms in the aftermath of slavery and the transition to indenture from 1834, through a study of indentured Indian and Chinese laborers deployed to replace enslaved West Africans in Caribbean plantations, in particular Guyana, Guyana and Trinidad, and a study of the post-slavery interim category of apprenticeship in other colonies such as Barbados. Methodologically, I'm examining mostly secondary sources and UK-based archives relating to colonial administration in respect of important sites of plantation economy with heavy reliance on either formerly enslaved labour or indentured workers. These investigations are critical to interrogating the historical continuities between forms of law regulating slavery, apprenticeship, indenture, master servant, and then free wage work. But it starts with the intuition that the emergence of the contract of employment owes a great deal, not just to master and servant law, which those of us who study labor law in this country are familiar with as a historical origin of contemporary labor law. So the intuition is that the emergence of the contract of employment owes a great deal, not just to master and servant law, but to the colonial jurisdictions as important sites of experimentation and development of workplace norms. So I'm interested in techniques and technologies of the most extreme form of unfree labor, slavery, and how this was regulated at the beginning and at the end of the period of racialized Atlantic slavery in order to understand the legacies and continuities for later forms of unfree and free labor. I want to begin by saying something about use of two terms which are in the title of today's lecture, race and legal form. With regard to race, there is significant divergence between those states where um, jurisdictions as to how race is conceptualized, measured, monitored. So some countries or cultures in which public discourse is dominated by what we might call colorblind or race neutral philosophy are might by a rejection of or an ambivalence towards the use of race as a valid analytical category in social or political discourse or for the purposes of social policy, such as inequality data collection. In an approach which may well be motivated by anti-racist sentiments, many European states are avowedly colorblind in their policies and reject or criminalize the collection of statistical data on racial or ethnic lines. So when it comes to law, racism within work is typically understood and race is understood in a particular way. Racism in work is typically understood empirically and conceptually as individualized discrimination or prejudice. And race is conceived as a matter of individual, demographic, physical attributes. Racism is seen as personal moral failing rather than as a systemic practice embedded in society structures and institutions, including the labor market. So in contrast, what I wanted to show here is, is how race and racism operate at the level of social system and also as a dominant rationality to structure societal institutions such as the contract of employment, industrial trade unionism, the post-war welfare state, a more meaningful and significant response to structural inequality in economic life requires moving beyond the focus on individualized discrimination to trace the ways in which race is constitutive of the labor market. To put it in Marxist terms, one needs to think about racialization in which race is understood as socially produced. This requires a focus on historic exclusions and the ways in which historic causes of racism continue to have an impact on how the contemporary labor market is structured. In pursuing this argument, I make use of the language of racial capitalism. And one version of that language is, 
contends that the emergence of capitalism was per se premised on global racialized inequalities, that race permeates the social structures emergent from capitalism. So race, uh, racism or racial capitalism is, is thus the dominant rationality or the dominant way of seeing the world, which I argue underpins the market economy and the racialized inequality of the contemporary labor market. Um, that image is, um, I don't know if you can read it, is from um, uh, a piece of an artwork by uh, Barbara Walker called Reversal 2021. It's currently in the Fitzwilliam Museum, University of Cambridge, but in Boston, the outlines of, so she's taken a 17th century Dutch um, uh, painting and uh, of a wealthy white family and by embossing the outlines of this she accentuates the contrast with graphite drawing highlighting an anonymous black man in their midst and it's a Dutch 17th century painting as her starting point that reversal allows us to see him as an individual although he remains unnamed Um, I'd also like to explain my use of the language of legal form. Um, it's used in a number of different ways, but I, I'm following Zoe Adams and I use the term juridical or legal form to refer to the historically specific form which social relations assume in the context of capitalism. What became by the mid 20th century, the dominant labor market institution through which labor was supplied and used in firms and industrialized economies was the standard employment relationship. The legal or juridical form which that institution, the standard employment relationship took, was that of contract. A contract of employment governing a bilateral relationship between worker and employing entity. This form provides a historically specific and a regionally specific mode of capturing and encoding social and economic relations of labour within market economy. So for instance, the contract of employment emerged earlier in the UK, a bit later in Germany and France, but it was it co-evolved with industrialization. Um, social, socioeconomic practices such as paid employment are given recognition or expression within the legal system. But this recognition is partial. As both Zoe Adams and, and Rob Knox separately argue, legal discourse is too abstract to engage and deal with structural issues. It can only see social relations as interpersonal relations between formally equal individual subjects. Thus, this legal form, the contract of employment, is unable to recognize the existence of structural elements which can't be translated or expressed into a formal agreement between the parties. For instance, the legal form of the standard employment relationship doesn't see the unpaid work of social reproduction, such as care work or household labor, which makes possible the paid work at the heart of the contract of employment. The legal form of the contract of employment doesn't see the global reproduction of capital enabled by the labor of racialized others outside the territory of the nation state, such as historically, the work of enslaved people and indentured workers in the colonies. The emergence of the legal institution of the contract of employment during industrialization served to entrench the sexual division of labor and determine how women's work is valued and regulated. But further, I argue, it serves to hide the ways in which race and colonialism are also constitutive of the labor market, and I would argue constitutive of the labor contract. I wish to make three points here. First, that non-wage work, colonial expropriation, sometimes known as colonial plunder, migrant work, and the work of racialized others were historically key to fueling industrial revolution, and later key to financing the redistribution made possible by the welfare state. Second, with regards to the legal form of the contemporary contract of employment, the focus on this bilateral relationship erases the racialized practices and inequalities which produce the market in which that legal form is embedded. Third, the evolution of the legal form in the contract employ of the contract of employment has built on existing conceptual devices and mechanisms such as master and servant law. But it also owes a great deal to colonial jurisdictions as sites of experimentation. A focus for this part of the lecture is on the evolution and circulation of legal forms and labor practices between different territories within the British Empire. 
there was not a straightforwardly linear progression from coerced labour towards freedom under, freedom under labour contracts marked by consent. Um, we often tell a progress story, and this is what I want to question. For instance, this sort of absence of a linear story, indentured labour was in fact a form of labour supply which has been significant before slavery. As Chris Tomlins explains, migrant indentured servitude was an important component of the original work regimes of mainland English colonised America. Over the course of the 17th and 18th centuries, a majority of European migrants to mainland America, at least two thirds, arrived as indentured servants bound to service and hence unfree. That indenture of European migrants coincided, coexisted with slavery, racialized slavery of Africans. And indenture then re-emerged after the formal abolition of slavery, but it took a different racialized aspect. With regard to Anglo-American slavery and slavery in the British Caribbean, there's rightly a great deal of literature on the economic, physical, psychological impact of racialized slavery. My focus for now, though, is on slavery as a regime of governance. The legal form regulating the enslaved person is premised on status, the status of property, not on contract law. Enslaved peoples are not selling their labour. It is not their labour power which has been commodified, but they themselves are the commodities. However, the move from property to contract as the determining form governing paid or governing work, whether paid or unpaid, that move from property to contract isn't quite a move from unfreedom to freedom. So even after the transition of work relations to relations being governed by contract rather than through property law, the labour relation retains a significant element of coercion. Um, Chris Tomlins describes how the process of colonisation had resort to what he, he invents these terms, both a broad discursive, he calls it extra structure of ideas that explained uh, and justified the enterprise of colonization and a more detailed technical infrastructure of institutions and processes that managed the mobility and distributed migrants in the context of colonization. And then he, talks about Anglo-American slavery and its establishment as conforming to that same pattern. That the establishment of Anglo-American slave regimes rested initially on an explanatory extra structure that rendered enslavement legally familiar, appropriate, reasonable, and above all, legitimate, it's lawful. In addition, there was a technical infrastructure of processes to manage and oversee an enslaved population. So that distinction between extra structure and infrastructure, we can divide Anglo-American law of slavery into discourses which explain and justify and give legal legitimacy to slavery and technologies of implementation of slavery. So it's this latter the technical infrastructure, the legal form regulating the labour of enslaved peoples, which I'm particularly interested in because I want to look at that in order to track how those technologies of governance and exploitation find resonance in later forms such as racialised indenture, master and servant law and in today's labour contract. Slavery was a regime of governance dense in law. Its sources were the, the use of long established forms, but adapted for new purposes. So this um, is a rather dense um, slide, I have to say. Um, so to make sense of that explanatory um, extra structure uh, that made enslavement lawful, I turned to Holly Brewer's work on property law and the creation of a common law of slavery for England's, England and its new world empire. How was slavery granted legal legitimacy? For much of the relevant period of the 17th and 18th centuries, as Britain's American and Caribbean colonial settlements evolved into slave societies, there was ambiguity in the common law as to the legality of, of property in persons, treating people as property and enforcing contracts for sale of persons. Before 1677, colonial legislators, so the colonies had some measure of self-governance as by uh, 
white colonial administrators and colonial governors. Before 1677, colonial legislatures legitimated elements of slavery, but they were limited to following and manipulating feudal law on servitude and villainage, or master and servant, both of which had a variety of protections for the villain or the servant, which imposed limits on ownership. But crucially, colonial codes could not be repugnant to English law. So out there in the periphery of empire, colonial codes could not contradict English law emanating from Westminster. English law, as you find in the metropole, Parliament, Westminster, had tried in the 1670s twice, but failed to pass legislation given legal legitimacy to slavery. So Brewer observes that it was then left to the common law. She observes how it was only after a series of high court cases from the 1670s and 1680s did English law provide the regulatory <coughs> structure, the extra structure in Tomlin's language, of markets that made slavery as it existed in, uh, in America and in the, in the Caribbean possible. It was critical to create a common law of slavery in the British Empire, one that would cover the transport and sale of enslaved persons between colonies, regulate trade and confirm ownership. This was done through repurposing existing common law. 1670s onwards saw a series of judgments of the English courts, some contradicting each other um, and subject to the changing composition of the King's bench. But foremost amongst them was a case known as Butts and Penny from 1677, which originated in Barbados, which held that it was a King's Bench, uh, it was a judgment of the King's Bench in London, and that held that a person could be considered simple property and could be sold as goods. That line of case law from Butts and Penny ultimately was codified by statute in 1732, but crucially in the interim, it meant that the traditional common law mechanisms used for recovery of debts and damages could be applied to people. Um, so this is what um, Holly Brewer says um, about Butts and Penny. The definition of people as simple absolute property in terms of establishing and protecting ownership meant that the whole panoply of property law that was being strengthened in Britain at this, in this period could be applied to regulate slavery. So what you had was the application of writs known as writs of trespass, known as detinue, allowing the recovery of the good, the product itself, the enslaved person, plus damages, and writs of trover, which enable the recovery of the value of the good. It made enslaved people into a form of credit. Um, there is a huge amount that could be said and has been said about, we are living in an age of financialized capitalism, but what is happening through common law cases such as butts and penny, is financialization on the backs of ownership in people. So this line of case law, as I said, was codified in 1732 Debt Recovery Act. Um, so I, you can't really see it's um, under the reign of King George II. Um, it's an act for the more, the full title is an act for the more easy recovery of debts in His Majesty's plantations and colonies in America. And that required that real property, houses and enslaved persons could be treated as legally equivalent to chattel property, so movable things, for the purposes of satisfying debts in all of the British colonies in America and the West Indies. Um, so this was a formal definition of people as property People are subject to contracts and regulation, but the contracts they're subject to are not contracts which they themselves have a part. They are not a party to the contract. Uh, they are the, the subject matter of the contract. Turning to the technical infrastructure, to the legal form regulating the labour of enslaved persons rather than the legality of slavery itself, was the regime governing relations between enslaved persons and the white population as a whole, between enslaved persons and their masters, discipline, protections. Um, Barbados was settled in late 1620s and, and 1630s by English planters using indentured European labour to produce tobacco and cotton. By the 1650s, Barbados was dominated by large capital uh, intensive sugar plantations dependent on imported enslaved labour. Barbados became the first English colony to legislate extensively on slavery and became a template from which other parts of empire in the English Caribbean and the English and English America borrowed laws governing slavery. 
Starting with Barbados, every colony attempted to create a comprehensive law of slavery grafted onto existing English criminal statutes. So um, vagrancy law does a lot of work here. Um, police statutes which discipline the movement of populations forced vagrants to work. For example, adapted laws constrained the movement of enslaved people outside their home plantations, um, enacted a graduated schedule of severe bodily punishment, in particular for runaways, as they were known. There was, of course, considerable resistance and rebellion by enslaved peoples, but my focus for now is on the background legal framework. I want to return to the earlier observation that migrant indentured servitude coexisted with slavery to complicate the conventional narrative around um, transitions from unfree to free labour. In doing so, I draw on historians and legal scholars such as Lisa Lowe, Chris Tomlins, Douglas Hay and Paul Craven and Michelle Goodwin. The term indenture is used to describe a formal contract or deed made between two or more parties, typically with a specific duration for five years. Traditionally, identical copies of the deed were handwritten on the same sheet of paper or parchment with the copies separated by cutting along a jagged edge, tooth, hence the term indenture, so that the teeth of the two parts could later be refitted to confirm authenticity. The legal technology of indenture has been utilised in subtly different forms across the British Empire. For instance, as, as Chris Tomlins shows, uh, in the English colonies in the Americas in the 17th century, a legal form of indenture servitude emerged as a reliable means for facilitating extensive, large-scale, transoceanic transfers of, of useful migratory labour and then policing their activities once they arrive. Because the whole point of this written agreement is one party is committed to make a series of payments to the other. So, for example, payments in order to pay your passage, to settle debt, to provide subsistence, uh, perhaps a one-time payment in kind, sometimes cash, the other party to this indenture agreement agrees to be completely at the disposal of the payor for, for performance of work during a stipulated term. About half of all European migrants to England's mainland uh, American colonies, um, arising 60% in the 18th century, arrived committed to a period of servitude. And this has led historians to argue that the default position of labour was to be unfree, but Tomlin shows that this view was an oversimplification. The way he puts it is that modernity's single subjectivity, free labour, does have a history, just not the history of progress that normalises it. And what he means by that is there's a narrative of historical progress which posits a one direction, a unidirectional change over time from socially authoritative, authoritarian, patriarchal rule over economic activity to social interdependence. So we, instead of top-down rule, uh, the idea of that you are um, governed by this, the status you hold in law, instead there is this idea of historical progress to a social independence structured by a politics of individual consent. So a move from, and we, we do this a lot in standard labour history, a move from status to contract. Um, but the argument he makes is that in English America, Subordination, this unfreedom, was life cyclical. And it, for the European migrants, it was defined by their age. The unfreedom of these migrant indentured servants was situational and it was relative. They, unlike racialized slavery, the unfreedom of the European indentured workers was in relation to the, um, the payor. They, they didn't, unlike with slavery, they didn't automatically have a relationship of enslavement relative to others. So instead of a linear trajectory from a colonial era European workforce, which is predominantly unfree, towards a later 19th century free workforce norm, Tomlins argues that uh, instead that labour of colonising was highly variegated social activity performed by a highly segmented population. Working people were constituted by a variety of relationships, household labour, artisanal labour, day labour. They were yeomen, they were journeymen, they were artificers, artisans, but also they were configured through indentured servitude and through slavery. So rather than a generic legal culture of unfreedom, we have a stratified legal culture which accommodated distinct regimes of work. And um, 
And this is a point he makes, which I want to return to at the end of the lecture. By concentrating on the loosening of the bonds of explicit servitude, we have ignored the changes, the tightenings in the social and legal meaning of employment that began in England during the 18th century and continued in America during the 19th century. So um, the move from explicit servitude is replaced by a social and a legal tightening around when we move to the idea of employment. Lisa Lowe, um, in her extraordinary uh, monograph, The Intermediates of the Four Continents, but also in her article, History Hesitance, also takes issue with this idea of a linear progress. And she talks about the need to understand the conditions within which the liberal narrative of freedom overcoming slavery has been established in European and North American political and economic spheres. And this is a point I want to emphasise that she makes. Empire across continents consisted in the power to adapt and improvise combinations of slavery and residual colonialism with new forms of nominally free yet coerced migrant labour. Okay, I don't know if you can see that. Um, I, I want to move to talking about what I'm calling the racial capitalism of empire. And, and the question I want to ask myself is really, what do I mean by continuities in legal form? And I'm exploring four elements. Uh, first, what happened when slavery ended and other forms of labour, apprenticeships, indenture, sharecropping, as well as wage labour, took their place? Second, what changed and what stayed the same for the affected workers? And to what extent did employers and colonial governors use legal techniques to both maintain and transform workplace relations? Third, how are ideals of labour market freedom uh, reconciled with the reality of ongoing coercion at work? And to what extent did racialisation both continue, um, contribute to and result from coercive and disadvantageous workplace relations? Finally, I want to examine whether we can detect the imprint of rules, doctrines, practices introduced in the colonial era in contemporary labour markets. And if so, how might the the imprint of those historic rules help explain ongoing gender and racial fissuring in the, in, and economic inequality and precarity at work. Post-abolition, the required labour of post-abolition slavery, the required labour resources were typically generated through transition to free labour markets in which wage workers were subject not only to market discipline, but to new forms of legal control and coercion through contract, criminal law and taxation. Um, in Britain and the colonies of the 18th and 19th centuries, the dominant legal form for regulating work of those not enslaved was through a combination of the poor laws. If you cannot sustain yourself, you are at risk of being required to go into the workhouse, for instance. Vagrancy laws, but uh, laws regulating vagrancy, but also laws uh, around master and servant. Um, it's important to think realise that the servant in this phrase is, doesn't mean a uh, domestic servant as in sort of Downton Abbey. Uh, the relationship of master and servant here was a contractual one, constituted by an exchange of promises, but the status of the servant was defined by legislation which made it a criminal offence punishable by fines or imprisonment for the servant to commit an act of indiscipline or to quit without giving the agreed notice. So my point here is that the evolution legal the evolution of legal form in today's contract employment requires attention um, to the persistence of the master and servant model, but it also requires close attention to the racialized experiments with un unfree labor in colonial jurisdictions. So we have um, 19th century law of master and servant m governing the majority of, let's say, those working in, in the United Kingdom. A few of what would be known as higher status workers, for example, um, journalists, teachers, managers in factories, would be classified as employees. But the idea of employee was a, of a very was a, a new one. It was novel. Most people were governed by master and servant law. So most people were governed by this combination of contract and criminal law. Okay. But what and, and that's often where we sort of trace the evolution of the contemporary contract for employment from, we, we see elements of master and servant law in today's contemporary contract for employment. And we also see how um, the emerging 
idea of employee, the kind of higher status, also came to influence modern employment contract. But what I'm arguing is that we also need to pay close attention to what was going on in the colonial jurisdictions as having equally significant influence on the emergence of the modern contract for employment. So to turn to the regional plantation economy, um, that centred on labour intensive plantation agriculture, especially sugar production. Emancipation under the Slavery Abolition Act of 1833 caused immediate crisis for the planters. The 1833 Act compensated plantation owners in two ways, direct financial compensation, and for the majority of the British Caribbean, they were also compensated through continued stream of bound labor known as apprenticeship. So compensation direct form. 20 million pounds was paid by the British state to over 45,000 individual slave owners, accounting for about 800,000 enslaved people, over 80% of whom were in the West Indies. So uh, that 20 million pounds paid by the British state in relation to the size of gross domestic product of the UK around 2019, that 20 million in 1834 would be the equivalent of around 128 billion pounds in 2019. Um, and um, the UK Treasury unwisely tweeted a few years ago, if you are a taxpayer in the UK, you have been contributing to paying off that debt that the UK state incurred in that £20 million compensation. So that was the first form of compensation to um, planters and slave owners. The second was that they received the unwaged labour of apprentices uh, and that was designed to soften the impact of abolition on plantations and to enable planters to adjust to new forms of labour supply. The Act, uh, 1834, uh, sorry, 1833 Act, required formerly enslaved people to work for former owners as apprentices for a further six years in the case of field workers or four years in the case of house workers. Payment was in kind. So apprentices could work no more than 45 hours a week in return for provisions, shelter and medical care, not in return for wages. So there were significant local variations in the amounts of work exacted for the 45 hours per week. There were variation disciplinary practices um, between each colony and, the, and, and punishments, penalties were quite severe. Apprenticeship with its paternalistic connotations um, continue the slavery era labour exploitation and restrictions on liberty. It also provided new mechanisms to, to, to discipline labour and apprentices engaged in strikes and other widespread opposition to this partial freedom. As Mary Turner argues, apprenticeship was a short-lived scheme, but the contract terms it set for labour extraction from persons of free status had long-term consequences in the British Caribbean and throughout the empire. Apprenticeship set standards, first of all, for full-time wage workers in the Caribbean. While the abolition of slavery in 1834 and of apprenticeship in 1838 clearly changed the forms of domination that had prevailed, nevertheless, pre-existing power structures and unequal access to land ownership persisted. This was the context in which indenture re-emerged as a form of labour supply and as a point of transition from slavery to wage labour. Um, what were the logics governing the turn to indentured labour? As Walter Rodney notes, the newly emancipated po po population continued their struggle with the plantation owners under radically transformed le legal conditions, but under the same material circumstances. On the termination of apprenticeship, the freed population either preferred to cultivate their own land or demanded wages, and that made their widespread plantation employment impractical from the point of view of the planters. This is what Walter Rodney says. The struggle that resulted uh, and that assumed the form of protracted sugar strikes, and he's talking about uh, what was then called British Guyana, is now Guyana, uh, took the form of protracted sugar strikes in 1842 and 1848, strengthened the determination of planters to secure immigrant labourers whose conditions of indentured service excluded the right to seek out new employers and whose wage rates were also st statutorily restricted. So what we saw was large-scale migration approved and facilitated by the colonial office and colonial administrators from one part of empire to another. And that saw movement of more than half a million indentured labourers migrating to the Caribbean from India and approximately 250,000 from China. 
as well as providing cheap labour, Indian workers were, as Tayyab Mahmood argues, to be the medium through which planters could reassert control and discipline over African, African Caribbean workers. Um, there's also an enormous amount to be said about how this was also quite important in the construction of the identities of both African and Indian labour, the sort of um, assumptions and caricatures about the inherent qualities of both types of workers, um, with one being perceived to be unreliable and rebellious, um, perhaps not as fitted to agricultural work, another group being categorised, identified as being more industrious or perhaps more docile. Um, so indentured contracts typically committed the indentured labourer to serve for a period of five years or more for a promise of wages and a small amount of subsistence. I'd like to offer an, in, an example of indenture contract from the 1830s, or rather the template for a contract for indenture which is ready to be signed and witnessed. Um, so as you can see, it's handwritten. Um, there are spaces for the person to write their name. Um, um, or to, to put their mark if, they, if they're not literate. It's in English at the top and then it's in Hindi at the bottom. Um, you have um, the statement that the indentured worker will receive, and there's a list of what they receive a day in terms of rations. Um, chitak is a unit of measurement, so it's so many grains of rice and dal and ghee and salt, and then annual provisions in terms of clothes, okay. Um, and it's to be witnessed before the uh, superintendent of the of Calcutta police. For me, that contract of indenture prefigures the legal form of the modern contract employment. So I don't know if you can see the phrase, um, I'm signing as a free labourer with mutual consent. Um, this is reminiscent of modern contracts where the employer seeks to use the contractual language of a formal document that they themselves have drafted and imposed to claim the employee or worker is in fact an independent contractor. So those of you who are familiar with UK labour law might be aware of hundreds of cases. I'm going to use one example. Uh, it's called Culwack, where um, Polish migrant workers um, migrate into the UK to work in hotels and food processing factories. At the time, the UK was a member of the EU, Poland was not. Um, they were mostly not literate in English. They entered contracts with an agency which labelled them self-employed subcontractors contract for services. So UK labour lawyers will know if you're signing something which says this document is, a, is as a self-employed subcontractors contract for services, the employer is saying the same thing three times. OK, so how often do you have to say I freely consent to be a free labourer for it to be true? Um, as Tayyab Mahmood puts it, the construct, sorry, I think, yeah. The, the construct of free wage labour envisaged as consensual sale of labour power by an autonomous, unencumbered individual in a market of juridical equals and that market is governed by strictly economic laws of supply and demand, that idea is the bedrock of this universal category of labour. And I want to question to what extent that's what we're seeing in the contract of indenture. Is that what we're seeing in the modern contract of employment? And uh, particularly because this legal form invisibilises the structural elements which can't be expressed in that written agreement between the parties such as the racialization, such as the inequality underpinning that relationship. Um, the legal form of indenture. Indenture remains an anomalous form of contract and is even more asymmetrical than the modern contract for employment. This period of indenture has, in, has been described as a new system of slavery, although the degrees of unfreedom of our Indian indentured labor are debated. But if one studies different facets of the system, recruitment practices, the indenture contracts themselves, the journey, conditions on estates, labour regimes on sugar plantations, altogether it constitutes a distinctive regime of exploitation. Criminal sanctions were imposed for what were essentially civil offences such as breach of contract, imprisonment for vagrancy, um, or being off the estate without a pass. Employers were very rarely 
prosecuted for their failure to fulfil contractual obligations to provide food, clothing, shelter or wages. So as my mood notes, indenture was akin to a standard form contract. You take it or leave it. You don't get to negotiate the terms. The rights and duties embodied in it were not negotiated or negotiable by the migrants. The sanctions for breach of terms were penal, not civil, contradicting the form of contractual engagement. Um, indenture like slavery was premised on an elaborate system of coercion that restricted the free movement of labourers outside their estates. It not only regulated the labour power, but isolated them on plantations. Um, I, by way of sort of conclusion, I want to give you an example. I want to turn to an artwork called The Procession by the sculptor and painter Hugh Locke. And I'll, you'll see I come back to talking about indenture. Um, I found this significant when thinking about how colonial history and the role of slavery and indenture within it is typically framed without acknowledging the agency of colonised or formerly enslaved persons. Lots of sculptures are assembled from materials and sources, um, coat of arms, trophies, plastic toys, boats, flowers, cardboard, which reference global histories and symbols of our age. His upbringing spanned UK and Guyana, and his work explores the languages of colonial and post-colonial power, questioning ideas of global cultural identities. This artwork is inextricably bound to the location of its display in the Tate Britain Gallery. It's site-specific work in several important ways. Um, each year, a British artist is invited under the auspices of the Tate Britain Commission to make a new work in response to the Tate's collection and to the grand space of the Duveen Galleries, which are 300 feet long neoclassical galleries, which were the first public galleries in England specifically designed for display of sculpture. The Tate Gallery was endowed in 1897 by Henry Tate, whose sugar refinery in London's East End specialised in cube sugar. The company merged with Abraham Lyle's refinery to become Tate and Lyle. The Centre for the Studies, Study of the Legacies of British Slave Ownership, which is based here at UCL, um, has studied Tate and Lyle's legacy. And this is what the, they say. We believe the firms founded by these two men, which later combined to form Tate and Lyle, do connect to slavery, but in less direct, in less direct but fundamental ways. The sugar industry on which the Tate and Lyle firms um, were built was itself absolutely constructed on the foundation of slavery in the 17th and 18th centuries, both in supply and demand. Without slavery, the British sugar industry and the wider Atlantic sugar industry would not have existed in the form and on the scale they did. Both are precursor businesses, but closely connected to slave-grown sugar, which formed the basis for developing the consumer market served by dry goods merchants and fostering and supporting industries such as cooperage. While it's important to emphasise that Henry Tate was not a slave owner or slave trader, it's not possible to separate the Tate galleries from the history of colonial slavery, from which, in part, they derived their existence. So this is a description on the wall of the Tate to, to describe Hugh Locke's The Procession, which is a procession of life-size mannequins. Um, and it's the idea that people assemble, they move, they celebrate, they worship, they protest. Um, and it evokes all such endeavours. And he imagines people moving through this in neoclassical space, claiming it for themselves. It takes, his installation takes as its starting point the history and character of the Tate Britain's buildings and its original benefactor, Henry Tate. More broadly, the procession, Locke invites visitors to reflect on the cycles and history and the ebb and flow of cultures, people, finance and power. The figures travel through space and also through time. They carry historical and cultural baggage. The evidence of global financial and violent colonial control embellishes their clothes and banners. So he takes share certificates and turns them into textiles to clothe his mannequins. Um, architecture of Locke's childhood Guyana emblazoned the flags and the bearers. Locke occupies a space that was founded from the wealth derived from an industry previously built on the labour of enslaved African people and their descendants, which subsequently relied on the indentured labour of Asian people. Locke says, he makes links with the historical after effects of the sugar business, almost drawing it out of the walls of the building. As noted earlier, even as contract, the labour contract is anomalous. How is so much coercion normalised and supported in law within free markets for labour? To conclude, my project relates to continuities in the legal form underpinning work,
slavery, apprenticeship, indenture, master and servant, there hasn't been a linear flow and to free labour, free wage labour. Despite the contractual nature of indenture, one can't describe it as a free bargain. Even re with regard to paid work in the money economy, where workers are free to circulate, unlike indentured workers, in a standard labour market, nevertheless, there remain coercive elements. Uh, criminal law sanctions may no, no longer be used to penalise runaway workers, but there remains coercion due to the inequality of bargaining power between the worker and the employing entity, the holder of capital. I want to end with the important observation made by labour law historians such as uh, Simon Deking and Ruth Dukes. While working relations may have become increasingly contractualised during the course of the 19th century, the master-servant model continued to influence the nature of such relations and the law regulating them in significant ways. My project enables us to view the legal form of the contract for employment also through the lens of its colonial legacy, in particular in the racialized forms of slavery, apprenticeship and indenture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diamond. That was excellent, excellent. Um, and it also leaves us five minutes for a short uh, Q&A session. I think perhaps one round of questions. Um, but Diamond has uh, graciously agreed to engage with. Could I ask how many of you would like to ask questions? Could you please raise your hand so that we can allocate and distribute time as equal? I see two hands, three, even if you Scratch your nose, it may be a fourth. So three, three questions. Um, yes, thank you. Thanks so much for that, Diamond. Um, I was just going to ask you about whether you thought about um, the terminology of modern slavery, because I was thinking about that while you were speaking and how that, as a construct, is um, really obfuscates the history of slavery and how it continues, as you say, to play into um, or to, uh, to define. Uh, the, the, the labour contract and other, and other structures um, of oppression, um, but also it, more materially, um, I was thinking about the case of Ibrahim Abar, who is um, uh, one of the recent uh, people who was recently convicted under new uh, migration legislation, the Illegal Migration Act. Um, and he was actually, so he, so he, took, he uh, steered a panel, uh, 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 boat across the channel and four, five people died um, and he's been convicted of uh, their manslaughter but also found to be a people smuggler um, and he's been uh, imprisoned for nine years. But he was actually found to be a victim of modern slavery and yet um, despite being found to be a victim of modern slavery he's also nevertheless vilified and so even in that situation you end up with the persecution, punishment, and banishment of the poor racialized um, person who uh, was fleeing a context in which he was suffering, and he and his family were suffering the consequences, the legacies of, of colonialism and slavery, who's then found to be a victim of modern slavery and nevertheless punished and ostracized as being a so-called illegal migrant people smuggler. So the, I wondered, f in, in, your con in the context you're talking about, where we see... Um, the, the, the migrant labourer um, being coerced, unfree, victimised, vilified, punished, but the, that's the norm under the racial capitalist empire you describe. You know, what's the work of modern slavery doing? Is it, is it contributing to the obfuscation of that? Is it doing anything good in ameliorating that? Um, should there be a different terminology? And yeah, just wonder if you thought about that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can we perhaps take all yeah. the questions yeah. since there's only three of them? Thank you for this, Diamond. It's, uh, it's so refreshing because I feel like I'm, uh, when one reads about indenture, especially indentureship uh, written by historians of slavery and indentureship, um, the question of consent seems to be a roadblock to coming further and thinking about the relationship between the different systems. And this helps us bridge them in a way that goes beyond, I think, even Mahmoud 
um, to be able to theorize what it means in, in contemporary terms. But I'm just wondering um, when, uh, when talking about coercion or consent, whichever uh, side of it um, you're, you're writing about, is it um, the terminology that seems to be in the literature is bonded labor or you know, unfree labor, um, when talking about this tightening uh, in the indentureship phase of, of this, the colonial kind of plantation economy system. Um, is there uh, a way that you've um, integrated this changing kind of, the changing norms and changing expectations around what consent might mean in those contexts? Because I think it's gonna make waves you know, either way. I just think um, it's just so hard to find traction for that language in, in talking about indenture. <laughs> in a way that shows that it is, um, that real question, new questions of consent were raised in ways that maybe didn't exist in the mm -hmm. same way in the this, in this slave uh, system. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'll keep it quick. Um, I see there's quite a lot of parallels between what you're talking about and modern temporary migration schemes today. Um, so I guess, in that sense, do you see uh, whether immigrate, modern immigration statuses and their corresponding conditions are sort of a continuity of this racialized legal form that uh, you talk about, where, but simply that the permanence of those conditions from the 19th century have been replaced with this sort of enduring temporariness of modern conditions. Um, and also just wondered, whether you see any significance in the fact that these forms of indentured servitude were showing a preference for foreign labor over local labor. Of course, it might be impossible to indenture local labor as well, but that's, it seems to be an express choice to have chosen foreign labor in these sorts of legal forms very often. Yeah, OK. Um, Thank you for those questions. Um, so Nadine's question about the language of modern slavery. So in the UK, there was a statute in 2015 when Theresa May was Home Secretary. She pushed it through, prohibiting what they, the term they use, modern slavery. And it was a sort of victory on the part of quite a lot of um, NGOs and pressure groups, especially those representing domestic workers, because it gives visibility to an extreme form of labour exploitation. And so... From that respect, I think that language is useful as a kind of activist tool. But generally speaking, I think I agree with what I'm getting from underpinning your question, which is I find the terminology of modern slavery really unhelpful in two respects. It's unhelpful if you're interested in contemporary labour exploitation because it sort of brackets off everyday labour exploitation, such as, for instance, failure to pay the minimum wage. This is everyday labour exploitation. And it sort of says, oh... We're not even going to bother having labour inspectorates to deal with that. And it says, but there are these sort of pockets of exploitation of, let's say, migrants, which is more than slavery, let's say, nail bars and certain kinds of sectors of where they have ethnic enclaves. And it just, it diminishes an attempt to really understand um, broader labour exploitation. But then also historically, I, I, it... Um, people, yeah, the term slavery is very emotive. And so sometimes people talk about chattel slavery to distinguish it from some modern slavery. Modern slavery, we're not really talking about ownership in people. I, 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 the language of unfree, free and unfree is not brilliant, but I prefer it because I just think the language of modern slavery um, doesn't help us to really get to the root of what is really exploiting and harming people now um, because it, it sort of um, exceptionalizes what is actually quite everyday. Um, and yes, about sort of migrant labor, and it sort of links to the third question as well. Um, so if I can kind of take the third question in relation to, to Nadine's point, um, what's been really interesting, the sort of post-war history of migration in the UK, um, um, 1948, something I've written about, others here have sort of done more work on it. 1948, we saw not just the creation of the welfare state as we know it in terms of 
the National Insurance Act came into force, the National Health Service Act was enacted, uh, but at the same time, 1948 was a British Nationality Act, and what that did was to um, create a state as a subject of the British Empire and, and, and um, form a colony. So if you're a citizen of Australia or Canada or India gained independence or a subject of an existing colony such as Jamaica, you had a right to move within the empire. And it wasn't migration because you were moving from one part of empire to another. And so we talk about the Windrush generation, for instance, um, off, off the back of that. So that was really much assumed migration for permanent settlement. And we have such a shift now. So there's this final question pointed to where, um, where labour migration is permitted in terms of we have a whole system of different visa regimes which assume cyclical migration, migration for as long as you are working for that one employer as a domestic worker. So. And so it's very precarious and you could have the same people coming on a fixed time visa and then leaving and then coming again. Um, and there is a similarity, I think. I suppose what I would say is that uh, when I used the phrase earlier in the lecture about colonial extraction, um, those workers or rather their ancestors who were in the geographic periphery of empire, in the context of indenture, for instance, post Second World War, were able to move the geographic core of empire. But they often remained in the economic periphery of the labour market. Um, and, and that is what I'm getting at when I say the contract of employment is racialized because um, we see, and this has been very, very pragmatic, last August, the TUC Trade Union Council issued a report, um, had, uh, it was a study of people on zero hours contracts, on uh, part-time fixed time contracts that they didn't want to be. They want to be on a contract that I know how many hours I'm going to have. So the different kinds of precarious work, which are not full-time, the same place of work, predictable hours, predictable wages, they are disproportionately um, experienced by black and Asian workers. Okay. So you have um, still black and Asian workers who are much more likely to be in the geographic periphery um, sorry, in the economic periphery, outside the core labour market, and more likely to be outside the legal form of employee. So they may be in um, service sector, delivery drivers, nighttime economy, security guards. Look what happened in the early lockdown past the pandemic. Look at the people who are more likely to be exposed before we kind of understood about wearing masks. People whose work meant they could not isolate at home. They couldn't do their work from a computer. Okay. Um, there was a racialized difference in where people are clustered in the labor market. So I think what I would say, perhaps picking up on Nadine's point and the final third question is that there forms, we do see a continuity in um, migrants or descendants of migrants uh, in the kind of racialized periphery. To come to Eddie's question um, about consent. Um, so, of course, we could talk about consent under economic duress, and it's still legally consent. Um, and so we meant, I meant to bracket that and sort of say, yes, just because I would starve if I don't work, it doesn't mean I'm not consenting to the uh, rather unattractive terms. But we're talking about what's really interesting for me and lots of labour lawyers know this, in other areas of economic, economic activity where there is an imbalance of power, consumer law, for instance, we recognise that the consumer is, is engaged in an economic transaction um, on the standard form contract of the retailer or the manufacturer. And we make allowances for that because of consumer protection law. And we do a little bit of that in employment law, but you have to be an employee. Um, if you're an independent contractor, you're meant to be, it's like business to business, so you don't get those protections. And so I, I do find that when, as in the context of labour and employment, we talk about consent, even if we are not opening up the kind of whole category of, we're not saying it's not consent because you, you, you work or you starve, I do think that I want to... I want to fold into my understanding of consent 
the structural context, which, um, I mean, I'm just thinking of the indenture contract being signed is in English. Why is it in English? And then it's in Hindi. But these agricultural workers who'd been driven off land by other policies of the British colonial administrators, um, the, the land was not able to sustain them anymore because of a turn in India to um, away from subsistence agriculture to cash crops. OK, so how much are we able to say the structural context is is mitigating, if not nullifying their consent. I suppose that's something I really want to explore. And I equally find the historical analysis absolutely fantastic, but they kind of stop where we want to start as legal scholars. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Please join me in thanking Adam. For the <laughs>